said and done, I want you to also, during the week, memorize Scripture. And memorize Scripture about Scripture. You know, 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecies of old came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were born or carried along by the Spirit of God. Peter's telling us how we got Scripture. Jesus says in John 17, you don't have to remember everything. The Spirit of God, the paraclete, is going to come alongside you, and he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance. So when they're actually writing Scripture, it is the individual who's writing the Scripture, and in writing that text, he is being able to explain to us how we got the text, how we got the Word of God, right? The psalmist says this, for the words of the Lord are pure words such as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times over. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them forever. So memorize scripture about scripture because when you're going through hard times, the word of God is what you need in your life to bolster you up and to build you up and to carry you through the difficult times. And we can put our faith and trust so, look at this, all scripture, Timothy 3.16, wouldn't hurt you to memorize that passage of scripture and commit it to memory. So, what I do is I have a, a pack of cards that I've accumulated over time. Um, they're called fighter verses. So, you just take a three by five card, you write the verse on there, then after a while you get five or ten of them, you can hold them with a rubber band, and then after a while you have to use a little clip and poke a hole in the corner and clip them together. However you want to do it, put your little in your pocket, or you can do it on your phone. And then you can just scan the text on your phone, and you've got it with you to pull it up to memorize scripture. So frequently I go back and I work on memorization. So the question is, is this, who do we trust? Where do we get our authority? Now I'm going to be talking about the Protestant church, which is over on one side. We used to have a big market. Protestant church would be over here, so if we had a continuum, and let me know if you can see this, and can they even see it on the camera? Kurt? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so over here we're just going to call this the Protestant church, and then over here the Roman Catholic church, and then here we'll call the uh, Eastern Orthodox church, or the Russian church, or what they might call
Martin Luther, the great theologian in Germany, began to read God's Word. He actually went down into the basement. There he found a copy of the Bible, and it was actually chained to the shelf because the church did not want anybody to read the Bible because you might come up with, if you read the Bible as a Catholic, you might come up with your own idea of what it means, right? And they didn't want you to do that. They wanted to be able to interpret it for the common man. Now, there's a certain amount of uh, truth in that because this is the people at that time were extremely uneducated. Some didn't read, most didn't write. They didn't have education at all. They lived in an agrarian society, so they're basically just farmers. And so, to protect the interpretation of Scripture, the Roman Catholic Church used their authority to interpret God's word, and then they would give it to the common man. Now, there's a certain amount of truth in that, but I also want to be very, very careful to make sure that we understand what they're doing. So, after studying God's word, Martin Luther came to this simple conclusion. He said, unless I'm convinced by the testimony from Scripture, I think that's in your notes. Do I have this in your notes there? Yes. Unless I'm convinced by the testimony from Scripture or by evident reason, for I can find neither in the Pope nor in the Council alone. So that tells you a little bit of what the church did. They had established what we call apostolic succession, meaning that Peter was the first Pope, and then through the centuries, the office of Apostle Pope got handed down all the way to where we are right now. And so they would say that if the Pope that we have right now is the equivalent of St. Peter, so whenever he speaks ex cathedra, or if he speaks a papal bull, or they give an encyclical, I'll talk about those in a minute, that is the truth and the standard. So that's what they believe in now. So he starts reading God's word, and he says, I can find either in the pope or in a council, that's church councils, since it's certain they have often erred and contradicted themselves. So if tradition and the word of God are equal in authority, he begins to study, and he's finding all these different people who disagree with what God's word says. So how in the world do you then understand who has the final authority? Is it tradition, or is it God's word alone? And so that began what we call here the Protestant, or Protestant meaning protesters, because that's what Luther did. He took a list of 95 different things that he felt the church was an heir on, and he nailed them on the Wittenberg door, which is the door of the church. I am held fast by the scriptures adduced by me, and my own conscience is held captive by God's word. And I neither can nor will revoke anything. See, it is not safe or right to act against conscience. God help me, amen. Or so help me, God, amen. That was his claim that we need to look at and only hold God's word. So there's five different views on where we get authority, okay? And I'll help you understand each one of them. The first one is sola ecclesia. Again, another Latin word which means only. And ecclesia comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which is the word for church. So, first of all, the Roman Catholics would say we as a church have the right to interpret authority. Second of all, prima scriptura. So if you're Eastern Orthodox, now you're over here, Eastern Orthodox, and they would say, well, Scripture is primary, number one, but number two is, um, so you got the Bible, number two is tradition. Okay? So over here, they would say Bible is primary and tradition is secondary, but it's still heavily important. Over here, you have the Bible, okay, and you have tradition, and they are equal. We use tradition to interpret Bible because the Bible has to be interpreted correctly, and it is tradition, apostolic tradition, that interprets the Bible. And so over the years, as tradition builds up and becomes more and more sophisticated, more and more stuff gets added to God's word that you will not find at all in Scripture. 
for instance, Mariolatry or the worship of Mary, uh, venerating saints. Sometimes they'll go into a church and they'll venerate a saint, they'll pray to a saint. See, so you can't pray to Jesus yourself, but you can pray to Mary, who's very close to God, and she will help you. You can pray to a saint, and they've got a million saints that you can pray for. Pray for, pray to that, and through them you'll actually get to God. That's the second Romans, right? Second Romans, exactly. And then regular fide, so that simply means rule of faith, and that is right here, regular fide, okay, the rule of faith, or belief, all right? And this is where the early church was. So when the first church started in the first and second century, this is what they held to. Then Sola Scriptura is over here. And this is where I am, right here. And I'll talk about that, and that's where Protestant, most Protestants are. Sola Scriptura. And then you have another one, Solo Scriptura. And this one is here, and it's held by fundamentalists who basically say, I believe God's word, I don't need any tradition, I don't need any help from anybody, if I want to know what it says, I just study the Bible. Now that's a good thing, there's nothing wrong with that, but the problem is, they also throw out all of the history of trying to understand God's word, and when you do that, you end up trying to interpret the Bible in your own worldview, in your own context. Depending upon where you live or what you've grown up with or how you understand things, you can get you can get pretty wonky out there. But these are the ultra ultra conservative churches. Don't tell me about church history. We can't really learn anything. We don't believe any of the church councils at all, and we can do our own interpretation. So I find myself right here. You say, well, why aren't you like the early church? And I'll explain that in a moment. Okay. So those are the five sources of authority. Now, it's real important, and I wrote this, got this down here, the Heritage uh, Dictionary in terms of tradition. What do we mean by tradition? It is the passing down of elements of a culture from generation to generation, especially by oral tradition. How many of your families have Christmas traditions that you do? Every year, your family might do something. Our tradition in our family is, what we have is we have poppers. I don't even know if you know what poppers are, but since I was born in England and my mom was English, we began using poppers. Poppers, they look, they're, they're uh, like a round roll of toilet paper with uh, nice Christmas wrapping on it, and you pull them like that, and there's a little popper in it that goes pop, and then inside you'll find a game and a hat, and it's a little paper mache hat, you know, whatever, you, tissue hat, you put it on your head at Christmas, and you read a joke or two that's on the Side. Everybody goes around the table and does it. So don't ask me why we do that. We just do that. If you want to see a picture of that, okay. <laughs> Next time I'll send you a picture of me wearing a little hat. But it's cute around Christmas time. And the kids absolutely love it because they hold one in. I hold the other. Then we pull it in pops. And you can get them like at Costco or whatever. They have sometimes old games. But nevertheless, the mode of thought and behavior followed by people continuously from generation to generation, a custom or a usage. And then a body of unwritten religious precepts or time honored practice of set practices. Okay? So that's important to understand. So when I'm talking about what tradition is, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that's handed around from generation to generation. Now, the, what's the problem with tradition? Think about it. It changes, doesn't it? Yeah. Grandma used to always say, by the time you get four or five generations down, what Grandma said, nobody really accurately remembers, but it, you know, it gets distorted and that becomes what things are. So there's two types of tradition. So we're talking about tradition now. In ecclesiastical, from Ecclesia Church, so two types of tradition in church history. That's really important to understand this. You've got a list in there for you. And 
And so I'm going to refer to tradition number one and tradition number two. And every form of how the church looks at it, they'll be either a one or a two. But you've got them written down there so you'll be able to understand. So here's tradition number one. A summary of Christian orthodoxy, that just means truth, that has been held by the universal Catholic Church. Now, what do I mean by universal Catholic Church? Some of you immediately think of the Roman Catholic Church. That's not what I'm talking about. Catholic just means one. So this is the one universal church, meaning all born-again believers in Christ are a part of the universal Catholic Church. Church, not Roman Catholic, but Catholic Church, meaning Catholic, one church, body of Christ. So I can go to Africa, and when I go there and I see my brothers and sisters in Christ, immediately we hug each other, we greet, there's usually crying because we're so happy to see each other, and I immediately have an identification with them because they're my brothers in Christ, aren't they? They don't belong to the same church body here at First Baptist, but they do belong to the universal church that belongs to Jesus Christ. And no matter where you are on the scale, whether you're Roman Catholic or whether you're super, super conservative over here, fundamentalist, you are part, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're a part of the universal church. Does that make sense, guys? Now, what ends up happening is along the journey, you pick up a lot of baggage. So the basic tendency is I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I place my faith and trust in him. I follow him in baptism. I'm not trusting in a church council. I'm not trusting in a pope. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I follow him. The spirit has come, renewed me. I'm a new man in Christ. He dwells within me. And whether I'm a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a free church, whatever you want to call your denomination, you believe that, then you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But along the way, you end up picking up traditions. Lutheran churches do things differently. They have a different, what we call, liturgy. Presbyterians do things differently because that's their understanding out of the Bible. Baptists do things differently. And then, really, when you get over here to Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, they really have a liturgy, and you don't ever, ever change that liturgy. If you're been to a Catholic church, they got the, you know, the whole hey, I'm God or whatever, the Spirit of the the Father and the Son. And they got the whole deal going on. So that's a whole bunch of tradition that's been piled up on top of what used to be true, pure Christianity. Now, where the church stands today is not in a good place. That's why I'm not a Roman Catholic, because they got all kinds of garbage that is absolutely unbiblical and not true at all. But there are people within the church. Who are saying, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know Father Larry. He used to be out of the mission. Incredible man of God. He used to come to our band of brothers. He was a he was a Franciscan monk, okay? This is what he told me. He said, Pastor Mike, he said, I tell you what, if I wasn't a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, because I, I used to talk to him about papal authority. Do you believe in the Pope? Ah, that guy, I'll tell you what, he's, he's off the rock or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> So you believe in Jesus Christ? You do. Absolutely. And Mike, when you come and you do a Bible study up here, I want you to preach Christ and Christ alive. And I'm like, wow. And he didn't let, you know, no tradition or anything like that, just preach Jesus. And so, and then he said this to me. He said, Pastor, if I wasn't dressed in all this garb and had to go out here at this mission, I'd come to your church and be a part of your church. I'm like, well, why are you remaining <laughs> yeah. Catholic? You know, I said, well, they got to do retirement programs. <laughs> man of God, and he loves the Lord. I know he's a saving born again man. I've been in good conversations with him. So, so now, we can differentiate uh, that word Catholic. Uh, yes. Catholic versus the lower. Yeah, you can do that if you want. Yeah, yeah. But the one whole, that's why if you memorize the Apostles' Creed, I believe. You, you heard of the Apostles' Creed? Some of you have, some of you have. The Creed was written in the first, second century, right about here or so. And one of the things it says, I believe in the one holy Catholic church. And, um, and when they creed written in first, they say it's the Apostles' Creed written in the first and probably second century, sometime between there, the church began to formulate and understand.
understand what to believe. So remember we said systematic theology is a summarization of what the church believes. That's what they began to do with the Apostles' Creed. They began to summarize everything that the church believed in order that they might be able to articulate and pass down. They memorized this. Now, now why in the world would they put together everything that the church believed, the essential things the church believed, and memorize it? Illiteracy. Illiteracy. They, they didn't have what you have right here. See, we, we assume that the, you know, the, the early church had this. They did not. They had the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written in the first century while Paul was on his journey in the book of Acts. So much of the first century was writing into the second century the word of God. So if you went to a church and you lived in Ephesus, you got a letter from Paul. And the letter was called what? To the church at Ephesus. Then that letter would get copied several times over. Okay? This is all by hand. They would copy it. And then they would pass it on and take out the name Ephesus and write in Colossae. And that would go to the church that was established in Colossians, as we know. And then they would write it and scratch out Colossians and they would put Philippi to the church, and the letter was called the church to the Philippians. So that's how copies of God's word got distributed, but they didn't have a Xerox machine. I mean, it, broke. it was broken. Yeah, the internet was down because the Russians had come in and invaded the <laughs> So nevertheless, so everything then was committed to memory. So there's a certain amount of tradition, like the Apostles' Creed, that we hold to. We understand it. We memorize it. And we hold to that. So over here, they throw out all tradition and say, forget it. We don't care anything about that. That's all tradition. I'm saying, hey, wait a minute. It's tradition, but the kind of tradition that it is, it's based on scripture. It's very accurate. So look at what it says here. A summary of Christian orthodoxy, that's truth, that's been held by the Universal Catholic Church since its inception. It is infallible. Watch this. Only because it accurately represents Scripture. If it does not accurately represent Scripture, it is not true tradition. So, do I believe in tradition? Yes. Is it equal to Scripture? No. But as long as that tradition accurately reflects God's Word, then we can safely say it's part of the church. If it does not accurately represent scripture, it is not true tradition, therefore it is subject, therefore it is subject to the scripture, often referred to as, and again the Latin term, the rule of faith, which is right here. This is what they did. This is what the early church practiced. Okay, so let's say I'm an apostle of the early church, and I'm traveling like Paul was, like all the early apostles were. And I would go to a church and I would preach. Well, they would take what I said and how I interpreted the scripture as the truth. And they would say, Brother James came and he spoke at our church. And Brother James said this. That's truth. James also wrote a book of the Bible. Or Brother John came and he spoke. And when he spoke, he is speaking the very words of God because he is an and then he had a disciple by the name of Polycarp, who was not an apostle, but what we call a early church father. And then you go down the list of good men who began to formulate and understand, and then eventually take all of the scriptures that were written to the individuals and bind them together in what we call now the New Testament. So just like the Old Testament was everything from the Word of God given by prophets, they actually recorded scripture, thus said the Lord, and they wrote it down, and then they handed it from generation to generation, so they did in the New Testament. Okay? That's tradition number one. Second tradition here. An infallible, unwritten body of material that contains information beyond that which is contained in scripture. So, the Roman Catholics have tradition number two. They have stuff that isn't contained in Scripture, but 
since the church interprets the Bible, it's equal to Scripture. So whatever the Pope says in a dogma or an encyclical or uh, ex speaking ex, ex cathedral from his chair, again, they equate that equal to and has authority over Scripture. So if the church is interpreting the Bible, church holds to tradition, everything that church says is going to be put on you to obey. And so that's why you go to a Catholic church and they go, what is with all this stuff they got going on in here? Why do they do that? They stand and sit, you know, lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 you know, they, I don't understand why they do all that stuff, but they do. Now, questions? Joseph Smith was in the United States of America and discovered these glasses that are able to read and interpret the Bible, and he was able to do that and has a completely different interpretation. So we would call that. My question is, he's raised in that kind of environment. Yeah, in this sense. Trust in Jesus and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has revealed in Scripture. And generally speaking, what happens to those people is when they realize the church is not teaching the truth, they leave the church. Right? So, you know. Yeah, yeah, right, right. 
he's a nice guy. I'm sure they are. Mormons are good, nice, moral people, but the Jesus they believe in is not the same. And they'll use the same terminology that you and I do. They'll talk about the gospel. They'll talk about Jesus. They'll talk about salvation. They'll talk about being saved. And then the question is, is what do you mean by that? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. You'll find, you know, Eastern Orthodox. So the church split in 1000 A.D. The one part of the church went to the north, which became Russia, Eastern Orthodox. And then the other part of the church went south down to Rome, which became the Roman Catholic Church. So Greek Orthodox is the same thing as Eastern Orthodox. Some little variations along the way, depending upon where you are. So... Like, for instance, in Africa, in Ethiopia, where I go, it's a heavy, heavy Orthodox church. So everybody will have a cross around their neck. They believe in Jesus. The priests, they're all dressed in black. They have the big, long beards, you know, and they'll carry a cross with them. And when they're walking down the street, it's not unusual for people to stop in front of the priest. The priest holds out the cross, and they kiss the cross, or they'll bow down and make the sign of the cross. So, again, a whole bunch of tradition wrapped around, you know, the Bible. And many people, say, the, the danger about this, these two traditions right here, is simply this. They end up knowing a lot about tradition, but their knowledge of the Bible and who Jesus truly is, is gone. Because it's the tradition that they cling to. Sad, isn't it? Yes, Well, yeah, they do that as part of their worship, their liturgy, and there's meaning in all of that, and everything has a meaning. So it's not they do things that are meaningless, it's, it has a meaning, but many people who go to the church don't understand the meaning. Okay, what, tell me. Uh, we're going back to the illiteracy of the first thousand years, and, you know, plus a hundred. Right. Right. When you're kneeling, you're being penitent. Right. Again, uh, about out of respect, and uh, you're sitting there uh -huh. kind of at ease. Right. Okay. That's probably, yeah, that, make, that makes total sense. They have, they have meaning to it all, but the average guy, if you go into and ask them, how come you kneel and stand and sit, they'll, they're just not sure. They don't understand. It's a lot of, lot of ignorance in the church because they don't really study Scripture or their traditions. What else? Was there another question somewhere? No? Okay. So let me press on here. So tradition number two, look at it. Infallible, unwritten body of material that contains information beyond that which is contained in Scripture. This tradition began with the apostles' teaching, watch this, and is passed on through a succession of bishops or other apostles, right? It's only revealed when issues arise that make it necessary for a pope or a council to speak authoritatively from this deposit of information, often referred to as living tradition. So a pope will address it if there becomes an issue. But they have this whole vast supply of tradition. And the problem with the traditions that they have is there isn't a universal agreement on them. Some popes, popes teach something completely different, and the next pope comes along and he changes or tweaks it, and that's where we end up having a lot of trouble. All right. Are you guys following me? Okay. Am I, am I boring the heck out of you? No, not at all. Okay. I just want to... If we are, maybe this will help you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Where did you get that? Don't worry about it. Well, yeah. We have... Yeah. Okay. Well, those are the hats. I have no idea how you got that. That was a long time ago. Okay. Can we go back? There we go. Thank you. Okay. Next time I'll bring poppers and everybody can enjoy them, right? All right. Now, regular fede or the rule of faith. It's a Greek phrase used often in the early church. So the early church 
would use this phrase over and over again, the rule of faith, right? Was seen as faith, which is, was held always everywhere and by all. It was seen as being inherited and passed on not through an avenue of inspired, infallible information distinct from the scripture, but as a representative of the essential doctrine and moral elements of faith contained in scripture. So remember what we said, systematic theology is trying to take everything that the Bible says and put it into plain English on a certain topic. What does the Bible say about any given topic? What does it say about Jesus? What does it say about the Trinity? What does it say about salvation? What does it say about the end times? So they were summarizing, in a sense, building their own theology of what the church held to in order to teach people about that. All right? So let's talk about the different senses of authority. The first one is solo ecclesia, which is over here, Roman Catholic. I'll give you a, a slide on this, and you've got a copy of it. Belief the tradition represents by the magisterial authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Notice I say Roman Catholic. It's infallible, equal to Scripture as a basis for doctrine. It's its final authority in matters of faith and practice since it must define and interpret Scripture. Adherents, people who hold to it, Roman Catholics, and they hold to, remember in your handout I gave you Tradition 1 and Tradition 2, that's what they hold to. Sometimes it's called a dual source of authority. Why is it a dual source of authority? Because they believe tradition and they believe scripture and they believe that they are equal. So that's a dual sense of authority. Let me finish this slide and I'll get to your question. So you got solo ecclesia at the very top. Contend earnestly for the faith, which is one should all deliver to the saints. That's what Jude says. You have the deposit of the faith, which is the word of God. Then you have the Catholic Church, unwritten, infallible tradition. And then you have written, infallible tradition. Notice, you have infallible there under the Catholic Church. That is tradition and scripture. That is tradition. Now, when you look at that, what's on top? What's, the, what's, what's above Scripture? The church, right. So in so much as the church interprets the Scripture correctly, that's what we believe. So they would say that these two authorities, the church and tradition, are equal. That's why they do what they do. That's why I'm not a Catholic, because their tradition doesn't always follow Scripture. Is traditions important? Sure, some traditions are good traditions, as long as it reflects Scripture. When it doesn't and it gets wonky, that's when we say no. Let me read to you from their own catechism, okay? So if you ever go to church, how many have been catechized? You went through a teaching of catechism, okay? Here's what they say. This is what they say in their book of catechism. Listen to this. Sacred Scripture is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. Would you agree or disagree with that? Agree. Second, and holy tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their preaching. Well, there's a certain amount of that that is true. Obviously, if you're talking about apostles, the tricky part becomes is they believe in apostolic succession. They believe that the guy who's pope right now is the equivalent of St. Peter, who was, in their mind, the very first pope. So, question number two in the Catechism of the Holy Catholic Church, as a result, it says, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scripture alone. Do you see that? 
both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. That's where they end up. I mean, look, I mean, do you honestly think in the first, look at, look at, they, they put on all that holy hardware, you know, they got the hat and the chains and the rope and all the, all the stuff that they wear, you know, with their robes and their, their little beanies and all that stuff. And they walk, do you honestly think that that was the first century apostles? You think Peter dressed like that and walked around with a cross saying, kiss, 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 kiss? No way. But see, when you have tradition connected as being authoritative, then you can, and you can begin to do that. Yeah. 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 It became a it became a power a power thing. A kutraman was to demonstrate that to right. everybody else. Exactly. I'm equal to the king of France, the king of England, yeah. the princes of Germany. Yeah. It became a, it became an office of power, right? Political. So the church historically, you know, begins in the first century here. But then, like I said, in 1000 A.D., a little bit after, it splits into the eastern side and to the western side. But this became because if Christianity is the national religion that you believe in, then obviously the person who is dictating the laws becomes not just an ecclesiastical figure, meaning a high church person, but he becomes the equivalent of like a king. He becomes the equivalent of a power. And the reason the church split was over power. They say it was what they call the filioque way, the difference between whether the father sent the spirit or, or, the, or the spirit proceeds from the son or the spirit proceeds over the father. Stupid thing, they split. But, but understand, it wasn't about theology, it was about power. It was about who tells who and what to do. And so these guys lived very well, very rich, uh, had a lot of lands, a lot of properties, just a massive amount of money that was given where they became the sole uh, proprietor and keeper and financier and everything else. Yeah, look at the church. Look at, yeah, look at the beautiful, beautiful chapels. And, and they're all built with meaning, and I'm not saying, you know, but they were built on the back of peasants, you know. Skip a meal today and give your money to the church for this elaborate building. We don't do that in Protestantism. Protestantism, our buildings are rather simple. We, we just use them functionally, and we don't believe that this building is the church. We believe you are the church. And whether you're meeting in an, in an alley or you're meeting in a cave somewhere or wherever you are, two or three of you gathered together, Christ is there in the midst you constitute, in one sense, the church. And the authority in the church is invested, first of all, in the people of God, under the Word of God. So you have the Word of God, you have the people of God, you have the elders and deacons, and they follow God's Word. And the congregation has the sense of final authority in so much as they follow God's Word. But when we get to ecclesiology, we'll talk about that. Questions? Okay, so maybe this will help. You will see on this slide how people begin to answer the question, where's their authority? If you look down at the bottom, you'll see tradition. You'll see uh, this is a reverse triangle with the front being at the very front of the triangle, and then the back is the rear. So, we would say this, the Catholic Church would say tradition is first, next to that is Scripture, and then beyond that is reason. So they believe tradition first, Scriptures second, and then your reasoning, your understanding, then general revelation. General revelation means simply this, outside when you look at the trees, the world, the plant, all those things out there represents God's creation, the stars, 
and what we can reason and understand and see from the world around us. Then you have on one side experience and you have on the other side emotions. All of those experience and emotions should follow Scripture. Now, the problem today in many churches is that this triangle is reversed the other way. There are churches that have experience and emotions. First, yeah, that becomes the first thing. Did you experience this? I felt this way. They pursue the emotional part of the faith. Now, does true faith have emotions and experience? Absolutely. I mean, don't you ever read the Scriptures and you feel great joy in your heart when God is speaking to you? Don't you feel warmed on the inside? Don't you feel like praising the Lord and rejoicing when you're singing? But it all begins from tradition in the Catholic Church and in the Protestant Church, Scripture. Scripture drives our will and our mind and ultimately our experience and our emotions. So there's a group of Christians out there and is led by a guy by the name of Rodney Howard Brown. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But they'll, they, will believe, they believe in the church uh, the Holy Spirit of laughter. And so you'll go to the church and someone will start laughing and then somebody else will start laughing and people start laughing at the people who are laughing and everybody's laughing, you know, like a comedy club. Well, that's emotions and experience. But they believe that's the Holy Spirit giving them joy. Oh, you know, it's nuts. If you walk in there, you go, what is going on here? This is the strangest thing I've ever seen, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's the spirit of laughter. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. But people today are driven by the emotional experience. That's why when I talk to somebody, I do tell them about my faith. I tell them what God did for me, but I also let them know that it's all derived from Scripture, from the truth of God's Word. And when we get together, we'll, we'll talk about how we even understand God's Word and how we understand the truth of it. Okay? You, you following me? Okay, should I go on for another five minutes and then do questions? Does that sound okay, guys? Okay. So, number one, this is what makes their teaching infallible. The Pope, speaking alone concerning matters of faith or morals, ex-cathedral, papal bulls, and encyclicals, those are all different ways. You can just Google those if you want to know what a papal bull is. When, they give a, when somebody is canonized and they become a saint, they issue a papal bull or an encyclical. Encyclicals are issued by the Pope, not necessarily always equaling Scripture, but in one sense, they are warning. So the Catholic Church, when Nazis first began in Germany, the Catholic Church was coupled closely with the Nazis. But then when the Nazis started to go a completely different direction and kill people, the Pope issued an encyclical in German, the very first one that was ever written, not in Latin, but in German, so the common German people can read it, saying, we as a Catholic Church do not support and agree Hitler and the Nazis. Okay? An important document, but nevertheless. Second, when the Pope and the bishop speak together concerning matters of faith and morals... Right? So they have, all the time, they gather and meet in Rome to discuss matters and issues of faith and practice. So here are some of the things that you will find. Does the Catholic Church believe in birth control? They don't. That's why if you have a Catholic family, it's not unusual to have 10, 15 kids. Yeah, could be. Could be, yeah. So, but then you got to ask yourself the question, what does the Bible say about birth control? Right? Good ethical question. Be fruitful and multiply. See, I got three kids, five grandkids. I look back on my life, and this is just me now. I look back on my life, and I kind of wish I had more kids. But then I look back on my life, and I'm like, I'm glad I didn't have more kids. <laughs> 
But at the same time, I didn't really, I didn't really, when, when, you know, when we practiced birth control, I didn't really think about it from a biblical perspective. I just adopted it because that was the way that everybody did it in the United States. I didn't think about it even biblically. Then later on in life, I started thinking, when God says be fruitful and multiply, what does he mean? It means be fruitful and multiply. Now, I do think you can practice birth control. I think it's okay. But I think you should have a good, healthy family that follows the Lord and have as many kids as you can to work with. I mean, some people are just not built to have 10, 15 kids. My wife's grandma had 15 kids. 15. They ate in shifts at the dinner table. They had a picnic table. First group came in, sat down, and ate. They left. Second group came in, sat down, and ate. They made coffee in a big pot, boiled the grounds, shook up an egg, cracked it, stirred it. The egg grabbed all the grounds and took it to the bottom. And then they would come by with a cup and they would just scoop a cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's how to make coffee, right? All right. You see, what did you learn today? You learned how to make coffee. There you go. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll hold right here. Questions? God's revelation is continuing through the popes. Yeah. They would explain it. They would give you the meaning, right? It's just one joke about this Catholic priest comes down to the basement. Did I I tell you this before? He goes down to the basement, and he picks up a Bible, and he starts reading, and he comes back up out of the basement, and all of his brothers standing there, and he's crying. He's crying. He goes, what's the matter? And he goes, the word is celebrate. Not celibate. (laughs) They misinterpret it. (laughs) Yeah, Dan. That's a great, that's a great question, Dan. And the question is this. In several places where Paul refers to tradition, what is he referring to? particularly 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is about uh, head coverings. And then he goes into, uh, so if you want to look at 1 Corinthians 11, and then he goes into the length of a man's hair. And he says, it's not proper or natural for a man to have long hair. And that whole chapter, he is arguing that there should be a distinction between the male and the female, okay? And the question is, is do we wear head coverings today or is that a tradition? At the end of that chapter, 11, uh, verse 16, is it? Uh, He basically says this. If somebody is contentious or argumentative about it, he says, we have no such customs, neither do the churches of God. Is that at 16? Okay. I actually got a verse right. That's pretty good. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, verse 16, right? So we have no such custom. Somebody read that out loud. Uh, But if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor have the churches of God. Right. So there he is referring to a tradition. And that's why... I hold to sola scriptura, okay? Uh, not, not solo, but I hold to sola scriptura, which does involve some tradition as long as that tradition is equal to the Word of God, supported by God's Word. Because there were, you know, Paul, you know, he said, till I come, Paul's referring to them, what does he say? When I come, you should be reading Scripture, right? Anybody remember that passage of Scripture? Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to prayer. He, get, he starts to outline a little bit of the liturgy of what the church should be doing. So we do have tradition that's handed down to us. We gather together to worship the Lord, as they did in the early church. So some of those traditions are good, but... We always say Scripture is over the tradition. 
So if those days, if they had somebody come in with really long hair, and remember Paul is saying a man should look like a man, a woman should look like a, a woman, but if somebody starts to argue about it, you don't, you don't go to battle over it. It's not a thing to split a church over. I mean, when I was a young man, I had long hair, and I was really considered rebellious. And everybody would read to me this passage of Scripture about a man. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. I mean, that's the first thing they went to. You know, you're, you're, you're in sin, Mike. And it became a very contentious thing in the church. They probably shouldn't have, yeah, done that. I got to wind it up. Yeah. Well, a Nazarite vow and the not cutting of hair is, is a separate issue that was part of taking a vow. But not everybody was a Nazarite and took that kind of a vow. That's a different... So, he, that, so if you had, like Samson, didn't cut his hair, right? There were some people who took vows. Either they cut their hair off or their hair was made long. But you can Google that if you want. Yeah, this kind of discussion maybe answers um, uh, historical versus... Yeah. Right, yeah, right. And, you know, Scott's taken a Nazarite vow, and he doesn't have any hair at all. So. All right. Then, yeah, yeah you, we'll continue this and finish this next time. Is that okay, guys? All right. Let me, uh, let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. And, Father, thank you that we are able to uh, have the word of God. We should count this as a wonderful privilege that we're able to carry a Bible because in some places they don't even have copies of the Scriptures. They hunger for it. They, they even want it in their language. There's something like 2,000 languages, Lord, that don't have God's Word. So may we, Father, study it, be blessed by it, realize the privilege we have in it. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Word. And most of all, we thank you for the Word, Jesus Himself. Bless our time, bless this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.